It is good to meet with you here uh, at Sharon Church. It is a good day. It really, I know it's cold, but it feels kind of springy. I don't know if you can feel that or not, but we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We've, we've pulled through another tough winter, I think, even though uh, technically it's still February. Where, where I'm from, we're usually still digging out the snow. So it's great to be in the house of God with God's people, and we welcome you, those of you who are watching online and taking this in. We know that God is with us, and we are God's people gathered together. It's so good to have an opportunity to come on Sundays and be a family, be a family. We're going to talk about discipleship today and the next few weeks, and uh, I'm excited to share with you some insights about that. But right now, I invite you to take a look at the back page of the bulletin, which is where we have some announcements. And I want to highlight uh, that we're going to have a combined Ash Wednesday service to kick off the season of Lent. Uh, that's coming up real soon. It's not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, you'll see March 2nd at 6.30. And so... Ash Wednesday, we had that uh, service last year. It was kind of modified because of the, the pandemic, but we are excited to be partnering with our friends, our brothers and sisters of Brunswick Island Baptist Church. And so the two congregations together are inviting you to come here into this space. And uh, if, you're, if you're looking forward to hearing somebody else's voice for a while, Pastor McKinney is going to preach a sermon, and he's going to bring a word that day, and we're going to have a little bit of music, but mostly it's, it's about entering into that time of Lent, which is a serious time of reflection and repentance and sometimes uh, fasting, but I invite you to think about not just attending, but who you might want to bring with you for that combined Ash Wednesday service. About the opposite of that, as it could possibly be, is Thursday night's our first bowling night. So anybody who wants to go bowling, supposed to show up at Planet Fun. How fun is that? Planet Fun at 7 o'clock, and that's going to be good. And then want to show you one more time this little video that we premiered last week about the upcoming opportunity next Sunday for an estate and will planning uh, workshop that we're having. So let's let's take a look at that. Good morning, church family. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Bud Michelli, a member of your finance team. And today I'm here to tell you a little bit about the workings of the finance committee and invite you to a special event that the finance team is hosting at the end of this month. The Finance Committee is charged with three primary functions. The first one is financial transaction management and oversight. This is overseeing the inflows and outflows of the church on a monthly basis, generating accurate financial reports and budgeting. The second component is stewardship and education. This means managing the donation and contribution process for the church, allocating designated funds as per the donor's request educating the congregation on all financial operations of the church in order to provide transparency. And then finally, it's uh, the, the last component is generating revenue for Sharon. This is required to meet the budget requirements of the church, done through the use of tithes, donations, offerings, gifts, grants, sometimes capital campaigns, and long-term estate planning and wills. And it is this last one that I want to bring to your attention today, specifically. On Sunday, February 27th, we're going to be hosting a luncheon after the 11 o'clock service in the Fellowship Hall. Um, and following the luncheon, we'll be conducting a seminar on the importance of having a will and long-range estate planning. The seminar will be conducted by Reverend Lynn Benson from the United Methodist Foundation. She preached at Sharon United Methodist early in 2022 in preparation for this event. We will also have a CPA and a tax attorney present to answer any questions that you have, may have at that time. So please, in your bulletin today, you're going to have a find a response card. If you're interested in attending, please fill that out and leave it at the exit when you leave today to let us know you're coming. 
and we'll follow up with you prior to the event. Again, that's the last Sunday of this month, Sunday, February 27th, following the 11 o'clock service. We'll have the luncheon followed by the seminar. And again, I want to take this opportunity on the behalf of your finance team to thank you for all you have done for Sharon United Methodist Church. And with all glory to God, let's make 2022 the best year yet for our community and congregation. Thanks very much. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to read our prayer request. Come in this week and what's in your bulletin as well before we have our time of worship. It looks like we might have some people visiting here today. We're so glad that you are. We're happy to always share uh, what God is doing in this place. We have in front of you in the pews little, little uh, rectangular cards. We'd love to hear from you, what brought you to Sharon today, how we might come alongside of you. But here are our prayer requests. I'm reading from the bulletin, and then I'm also reading from this prayer book of people that have just, uh, since the bulletin was printed, asked for prayer. So we're praying for Robert Henson and friend Ethan O'Neill, Don Campbell, Linda McLaughlin, Walt and Randy Wood, John Hamer, Teresa Evans, Joe Hickman, Sharon, Belinda Dixon, the Van Dryle family, Corey Reyes, and the family of Wesley Norris, Sandy Bristol, Stephen Griffin, Beth Larson, and Mary Kaiser. And the Christian brothers and sisters in the world that are living under persecuted uh, situations, are, uh, this week we're lifting up the church in Tajikistan. And so we pray God will help us to be faithful in lifting these up during the week as we are interceding on their behalf. And now I turn things over to the Legacy Praise Team. Good morning, church family. I don't know, but how many of you were excited to walk through these doors this morning? All right. I know sometimes we feel a heavy weight on our shoulders throughout the week. Sometimes we have a great week. But every time we walk through that door, the smiling faces, the welcoming spirit, all of that is lifted off of us, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, absolutely. Jesus is in this place this morning. Jesus is in this place every time you walk through that door, and that is why you feel the weight of the world off of your shoulders when you come here to worship with us. So stand and worship with us this morning. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we lift our praise and worship to you. Amen. Amen. One, two. Whoa, oh, whoa. Whoa, oh, whoa.
Have a seat, everybody. All right. It is time uh, for me to get together with the kids, so if anybody is a kid or feels like a kid or wants to be a kid or wants to bring a kid, come on down. I have something to show you. All right, Daniel. Here you come. Okay, here's some kids. Hello. Are you Ella Claire? You are? I read it on your shirt. Who did you bring here with you? Is this your brother? What's his name? Well, this is my friend Daniel. When you remember your name, could somebody shout out this fellow's name? Deacon. Deacon. We're so glad that you're here. So Daniel and I want to show you this picture. Can you see that? That is a picture of a man sitting in the rocks on the side of a mountain, and he's got a bunch of people around him. There's men and there's women, there's older people, there's younger people, there's even a baby. You see the baby? And in this picture, take a guess who this is that's sitting there talking to everybody. Jesus. It is. When you're ever at almost <laughs> And so you can't really go wrong. It's the answer, for sure. But what I wanted to talk about today is Jesus always was teaching people. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of times people call Jesus master and teacher. They didn't call him Jesus, his name. They said teacher or master. And what they meant by that was things about how to live. Me but he was something who knew how to do something and he was willing to tell and he would he would go not into a classroom to do the teaching but he would go out where the people were and he made disciples disciples that's a fancy word but really all a disciple is is a learner so if Jesus was the master if Jesus was the teacher then the disciples were the learners does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And so don't be afraid of the word disciples or to be a disciple. Did you know if you're a learner, you're a disciple? And if we're learners about what God has for us in our life, then we're disciples of Jesus because Jesus has given us a lot of good lessons that we find in the Bible. And so I just wanted to, to show you that picture and to tell you a little bit about Jesus who was a teacher, and his disciples were learned. Would you like to be a disciple? I'm a disciple. Anybody else like to be a disciple? Even out there? Sure. I hope you all do, because we're supposed to not only be disciples, we're supposed to make new disciples for Jesus. Well, let me pray now. Lord, I pray your blessing over these kids. I pray that they would be discipled well in their homes, in their church. I pray that they would feel the love of Jesus in their life every day as they learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I ask, Lord, that your hand would be on them, that they would be lights to the world as they are lights to our worship service this morning. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. If you would all wear your shirts that have your name on them every week, <laughs> that would be helpful. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ella Claire. I appreciate that. Let's pray. God, we are excited to be able to come together this morning. And it doesn't have to be a jumping up and down excited. It, it has to be 
about just acknowledging the fact that you are the God of the universe. You created all things. There's, there's nothing you can't do. There's no life you can't repair. There's no situation you can't resolve. You have created the sun that came up this morning, and you, you've created the flowers that are coming up out of the ground. You've created for us the uh, people of all ages, all nations and races. There's nothing beyond your scope of interest. And yet, we know, even as people have gathered all around the world to worship you today in their sacred spaces, both indoors and outdoors, you still have time and interest and love enough for us that your Holy Spirit is present, present with us even now. That's amazing. That's amazing. We give you praise and glory for that. What other God is like you? You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know how we got to where we are, and you know where we're going, and how things work out, and you're with us now. There is no other God like you. Father, today I, I pray for our friends and relatives and church family members who are listed in our prayer book today and in our bulletin, those that have been spoken and those that are on our hearts that have been unspoken. Lord, there are people that uh, when they are uh, in the need of prayer, they want as many people praying for them as possible. And so I pray that you would answer those prayers. There are people who are in trouble, really sick or their life has fallen apart. They don't really want anybody to know, but we pray for those people too. And we understand that there's nothing hidden from you. Whether people suffer very publicly or whether they suffer very silently, we pray that your healing presence would be found in all places, in every household, in every school, in every grocery store, in every truck, on every tractor, in every desk in every bedroom, in every kitchen. Lord, please, please just work your wonder-working, miracle-working power. For those who are sick and recovering from illness, for those who are recovering from surgeries or are awaiting surgeries, we pray that your comfort and your mercy and your grace would be upon them. We pray for families that are struggling, Financially, relationship-wise, wondering what's coming next and how they can best be prepared. God, may your spirit move among them, giving people wisdom and discernment about the way that they should go. Pray for the nations of the world today as we, we have the opposing context of celebrating Nations gathering for the Olympics that are wrapping up, and, and yet nations gathering for the potential warfare that always grieves your heart. We pray that your will would be done there, that peace would prevail, that your church would be on its knees in prayer, that there would not be armed conflict, Lord, that, that would cause our world to stumble even further into chaos. Pray for military folks and their families, that peace would come upon them, that your grace would cover them. They have to be called on to do the difficult things and to sacrifice, not just for this nation, but for all the nations of the world, especially those places where you want your church to reach, Lord your missionaries would be able to move freely throughout the world and get the word out to whoever needs to hear the good news of the gospel. And I do pray, Lord, that you would give us a, a sense of urgency in spreading the gospel. That people would know about forgiveness of sins, healing, and mercy, and grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came from heaven, who took on the role of a servant, who even 
bore the cross and died a death that we were meant to die so that we could live a life that you created us to live now in this world and forever. And as we worship you, Lord, help us to be your disciples, eager to learn from the Master, eager to be ambassadors for the Father, eager to move with the Spirit. Heal us, God. Restore us. Embolden us. Strengthen us. Give us a strong sense of mission here at Sharon. Not just the mission committee, but every single one of us. A strong sense of mission. We can glorify your name. In every household, in every place of business, every restaurant, every, everywhere we go. We pray that for our brothers and sisters in every church dotted around this community and throughout the world too. You are awesome. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, Sarah, can you pull up for us the, the Apostles' Creed? I invite you to stand with me as we say what we believe at this historic statement of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, would our ushers please come forward as we participate in worship through the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings. Gracious God, generous God, 
we dedicate these tithes and offerings to you. Use them through sharing United Methodist Church to build your kingdom in a way only you can do. In your name, Jesus, amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. Today's reading is from the book of Psalm, chapter 25, verses 1 through 5. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantingly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all day long. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You rich? This morning, I'm going to sort of launch into a six week message series that I'm just calling Creating a Culture of Discipleship. We talk about discipleship, we put it in our uh, statements of who we are and what we do, but sometimes I feel like we don't really understand discipleship. And so that's why if, if somebody says to me, what's your discipleship strategy at Sharon United Methodist Church? I'm not sure I can answer the question. I know that we're doing things that we should do to disciple people, but I'm not sure we have a strategy. And so what better time to talk about it than on mornings when we're gathered together where I can confess the fact that I'm not sure what our strategy is. We've been, I'm still getting to know y'all, and you're still getting to know me, too. But what, what I do know is, when Jesus spoke for the last time with his disciples on the mountain before he went to heaven, he said, go into all the world making disciples and teaching them everything that I taught you, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so, not a waste of time at all to talk about discipleship. And frankly, we should be excited about it. We should be excited about discipleship. It should be what we're about. Discipleship should be the foundation for everything that we do as a church family. And so, Creating a culture of discipleship is important. We'll, we'll deal with stuff like, what is a disciple? I, I talked with the kids about it this morning. What is a disciple? How do we make disciples? If we say we're making disciples, how do we know if we've made one? Right? Well, ask that question. How do we know when we've made a disciple? How do we multiply disciples? Because that's the plan. That's how the church grew in the earliest days, and that's how the church is designed to be now. Not just adding people to our church lists. That's not a strategy of multiplication. That's a strategy of addition. But the kingdom of God and God's strategy for disciple-making is multiplicational. So with all that being said, today I want to talk about just the three-dimensionality of Jesus demonstrated in his life so that he could be an example for his disciples about how to live the kingdom life. And so we see in Mark's gospel, right at the beginning, chapter 1, I invite you to join with me 
This is verses 29 through 39. So Jesus has been baptized, and he's dealt with temptation in the desert. He's called some disciples together, and now we see this. As soon as they, they being Jesus and his disciples, left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came, and he took her by the hand, and he lifted her up. And then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he, that's Jesus, got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And he answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there. Also, for this, for this is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. And this is our gospel reading for this morning. Hmm. Yeah. Disciples need to be three-dimensional. Have you ever had a kid or grandkid who came home with the assignment of taking flat Stanley everywhere? Flat Stanley, just like this piece of paper named Stanley, and everywhere they go. So you see these pictures of Stanley here and Stanley over here, and just kind of one-dimensional character who actually gets to do some pretty cool things. But we're not supposed to be flat disciples. Disciples are three-dimensional. Disciples are holistic. That's another word that we could use that's kind of a buzzword in our society. Disciples are holistic. And in this particular passage, we see three different dimensions of how Jesus lived his life and how he lived not only his life privately with, with his Father in heaven, but how he lived his life with his disciples. And I think it's worth looking at. In this particular passage from Mark, we see three dimensions. We see an upper dimension where Jesus is plugging into the Father. Remember after the, the incident where he healed Simon Peter's mother, said the next day after doing some healings and stuff, he went out by himself at the crack of dawn just to pray, to be with the Father. Many of you have that uh, as part of your life. You get up in the morning and you have some routines and among them, I hear people say all the time, in my devotions this morning, right? That's the church word for it. In my alone time with God, as I was studying the Bible, or as I was reading something contemplative, or as I was praying. If people get up in the morning and don't remember who they are or whose they are, it's kind of hard to live a, a whole dimensional life. I've also uh, loved hearing about couples. Now, Susie and I do not do this, but I've heard of one of these couples that I visited not too long ago said, at the end of the day, before we go to bed, we put on our pajamas, we read the upper room, we get on our knees by the side of the bed, and we pray the Lord's Prayer. We've been doing it for 50-some years. That's, that's pretty good. That upward dimension is so important. Jesus was doing that. He needed to plug in. We talk about 
switching over to electric cars. Whether you think it's a good idea, I guess we got to kind of prepare for it. And one of the th reasons people don't want to buy an electric car because the, they all of a sudden they don't want to be somewhere and the thing conks out. And you can't just call somebody for a can of gas. We're afraid about getting to where we need to go. And are there going to be enough charging stations? Are there going to be enough places for us to plug in? Well, spiritually, we've got to plug in sometimes. Whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening, because if we're really living the lives that God has called us to live, we're going to run out of juice at some point, right? In fact, this, this weekly ritual that we call worship on Sunday or going to church is a very effective way of plugging in and charging us spiritually so that we can face whatever it is that we're facing tomorrow. Sunday morning is the morning of the week, right? So Monday morning isn't the morning of the week. Sunday morning is the morning of the week. Jesus had this upward dimension. It was very important. He was God in the flesh, and yet he still demonstrated his need for prayer. His need for meditation, his need for being with his Father. I think that is so important to have this in the scriptures for us to see. Because if it's important for Jesus, you know it's important for us. Secondly, we, we see that Jesus had an inward dimension. As a matter of fact, Sarah, if you wouldn't put that triangle picture up there, uh, that would be swell. Thank you. The inward part of a three-dimensional relationship has to do with spending time together with other believers, with other disciples. Being in relationship. In the Gospels, if you read it carefully, you'll notice that except for when Jesus was praying to the Father, he was always with other people. He usually had at least three disciples with him at all times. In his most intimate moments, Peter, James, and John were with him. And a lot of the time, he was with all 12 of the disciples. And even more than that, it was not uncommon for Jesus to be hanging around with larger groups than that. We see in this particular passage that Jesus went to Simon and Andrew's family home. He was a welcome and frequent guest there. Jesus knew Simon's family, and Simon's family knew Jesus, and they enjoyed each other's company. It's interesting, when, when Simon Peter's mother was, was sick, Jesus, because he was so full, he was able to heal her. And I don't know why, it seems odd, but the first thing she does is she starts serving. And so there's this, there's this idea that Jesus liked being with other people, and other people like being with Jesus. There's also a depiction of Jesus at the home of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, where he went, and they, they seemed to enjoy each other's company. They loved him, and he loved them. Jesus was not a, a lone ranger by any stretch of the imagination. Jesus called people. And we see this in the early church, in the book of Acts. The people are in each other's homes, breaking bread, singing songs, praying prayers. In the homes, every day, gathering. The upward dimension is really important, our one-on-one -on -one with God. But that inner relationship, that's why the social distancing business has just obliterated this important part of who we are. And so if people are ready for it, come on, come on Wednesday and have supper with us. And it really doesn't matter if you like what we're having, although I always like what we're having, no matter what it is. Have something to eat before you come. If you're worried, there might be something you don't like. It's about being together. We have to be together. Wednesday is the middle of the week. 
That's why we're doing it. The Super Bowl party, we could have had a better party at our house, but we had a Super Bowl party here at the church to give people an opportunity to touch each other's lives. It was super fun, by the way. Susie won three out of four quarters in the pool. Seemed unfair. But we had fun with that. We had fun with the game. We weren't praying the whole time or studying about it. We were just hanging out, watching the Super Bowl, and eating food. Jesus did that too. Jesus went to the wedding, right? Jesus was a social person. He wasn't standoffish. He, didn't, he wasn't a holy man sitting on top of a mountain, except for whenever he did that to, to pray. And then there's the outward dimension. Relationship with the world. Reaching out, getting beyond ourselves, getting beyond even our church family, out into the world. Whatever that looks like. Whatever that looks like. It says here that after Jesus was fed and after Jesus did all that work around Simon Peter's house where people were bringing to Jesus. See, that's what happened. People brought people to Jesus. That's kind of more inward. But the next morning, after Jesus was prayed up, Jesus had the idea, let's go out to the surrounding neighborhoods. Let's go out to the towns so that I could do what I came here to do, and that is to teach people about the kingdom. He didn't really come to heal the sick. He didn't really come to feed people stomachs. He did that willingly, but what he really did was he came to say, The kingdom of God has come. Repent. That means turn to God. Together. And believe that. And then out of that belief comes our outward manifestation of being church. Jesus went out. Later on we'll see that when his disciples were ready, he sent them out two by two. He trained them how to do it. And we see scriptural witness that they were casting out demons and they were feeding hungry, they were performing miracles, and they were spreading the church. True discipleship is multiplying. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to just say, you know what, I, I've had this church and I've grown my church and I have this ministry and it's grown and grown and grown and there's all these people and then have none of them replicating the things that I do, that would be a mistake. My favorite idea is to get you ready to do those things that God is calling you to do so that you feel confident and equipped to do it. And so pay attention for opportunities for learning and growing and sharing together as Christian people. (laughs) Kind of a funny little thing, but there is a There's this little guy here. I don't know how this translates onto the camera, but he's standing on a three-legged table. It's just another way of expressing how our lives as disciples, in order to be stable, in order to be able to withstand whatever comes at us, we need the stability of the three legs, if not four. We're talking about three legs today. If one of these legs were removed from this little table, what would happen? Fall over. This person would be... We can't do it with just one leg. We can't do it with just two legs. The survival of this person is all caught up in the stability of the three. I'm not an engineer. Some of you are engineers. My understanding is there's a lot of strength in a triangle. The, the, the sides kind of push in on each other and provide stability. People build triangles into anything that's meant to be strong. And as we contemplate discipleship at Sharon, as we work on a strategy for discipleship, I think we need to be holding each other accountable, asking the question, how's it going? 
for us as individuals in the up, in and out dimension? Do we have, do we have well-rounded, holistic discipleship lives as individuals? And then how are we doing as a church family? You know, we've already talked about this real quickly, but hear it, Sharon, be of good cheer. Anybody that wants to be involved can be very holistically living out a life of discipleship through this church family. It's all happening. We do have the up. We're doing it now. Worship, there's a prayer meeting here every Tuesday. There's a prayer dimension on Facebook. There's a prayer dimension on email. That counts as up. If you're involved in prayer, meditating and reading God's word, don't just read the Bible, but sit and think about it. Meditate on it. Ask the Spirit of God to teach your soul something. Just praying for the Holy Spirit to align us with God's will. There's the, the inner dimension. We've, we've talked about it already. Spending time together. Wednesday suppers. Being part of a team. We have a choir is a team. The praise team is a team. They don't just come and do their music and get out. They like each other. They spend time investing in one another. The rows of Sharon volunteers, they're pressing in together as they serve. The handicap ramp building team, the, the money counting and distribution team. This is all in stuff. Doing fun things together. Let's go bowling on Thursday. Oh, I don't know, it's 7 o'clock. I'm just going to drag myself there. My toe still hurts. I'll stand there with one hand and throw the ball just because I want to be there. Shooting at targets on a Friday night. That's fun for some people. That's, that's in stuff. Attending concerts. In is all about encouraging the community, encouraging one another, loving each other. And then the outward dimension is a natural response to the other two. It's the overflow. You know, there was enough of Jesus to just heal Simon Peter's mother. And then later that night, there was enough left in Jesus to heal every, everybody that came that was sick. That must have been amazing. That must have been amazing. What that looks like here, I, I don't really know. I do know that we do have people that, that have experienced the power of God in their physical bodies, and we give God praise and glory for that. But we still have folks that are in the need of prayer for physical healing. We won't stop. We won't stop praying for physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, family healing, national healing. But the out stuff, evangelism, we, we kind of need to pull together some people with an evangelistic heart that want to get the word out. Coming alongside our neighbors, visiting folks when, the, when we're allowed uh, at nursing homes. I haven't been allowed much, but we're working on that. As a, we have people here that have done that as teams. Disaster relief, that's outward. Supporting other ministries, we enjoy having Kaleidoscope here. We've enjoyed supporting the homeless ministries, and we've enjoyed making sure that our foster parents have what they need. Those are outs, acts of compassion, partnerships, networking, whatever. Out. Most individuals and most churches are good at one or two of these dimensions, it's very rare to find a church or an individual that's, that's doing all three well. Think about this. Meditate on it this week. Talk to your friends about it. How are we doing on the triangle? And if we can see a weakness, what do we do about it? Let's talk about that. What do we do about it? Do we want to be strong? Do we want to be strong? We want to be like Jesus. We want to be disciples of Jesus. And disciples of Jesus do what Jesus did and does. Next Sunday, I'm going to invite, first of all, the 
legacy team to come now. Next Sunday, we're going to hear about hearing the voice of God as disciples, learning how to hear the voice of God and then how to respond and how to process hearing from God. I think that's, that's worth coming to talk about. I'm going to be asking for you to pray for me as I prepare for that. Because we've got to be able to process hearing from God. Because God is going to set our course. Right? And God will only send us into places where God wants us to be. So look forward to that. Hmm. Lord, thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to be together in this place. We love you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for setting an example of how to live a life of discipleship. Hallelujah. Amen. Stand and worship with us.
and and does it make sense to seek out ways of being holistically living out our lives of faith the way that Jesus is asking us to? Let's talk about it. Let's let's figure it out. Let's see how we can do better at it. Because again, when we've got all three dimensions, we're stronger people. We're more apt to be helpful. We're more apt to bring the kingdom here as ambassadors of that kingdom. Jesus has given us the authority and the commission to go into the world making disciples. Let's make them right. (laughs) So go now in the name of the perfect triangle, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you.